I'm Jade English, and this is Finding Feel Good. If someone's depressed, usually they've lost the ability. There's a whole lot of biochemical stuff going on, but from a narrative perspective, they've lost the ability to enlist themselves as the hero in their own story because they're outside of their window of tolerance for whatever's happening to them within them or around them. And so what therapists or good coaches will usually do is try to help them re-enlist themselves as the hero in their story by helping them to make sense of all the data points and give them tools to get back inside their window of tolerance, right? Even like the, the greatest leader, Dr. Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk and stuff, they all say like, it doesn't really matter what happened in their sessions. They don't, they don't want to understand everything. It's far more important that we understand what it did to you. Yeah, what protective and adaptive behaviors you have developed in order to cope with that. It's been a few days now since the breathwork journey and I've been feeling pretty good, to be honest with you. I feel a bit more loose, a bit more free. And I've also started doing F45 here, which I am absolutely obsessed with. I love it. It's like a little exercise class that lasts 45 minutes and it's just really, really good. And obviously I've been bimbling around on a scooter, which I'm also absolutely (laughs) obsessed with. There's just something about being on a motorbike or a scooter that makes you feel so free. And I'm not going to lie to you, I have snuck in a few little cheeky massages in there, which cost me approximately five pounds. So I'm not complaining there. And the food, oh my God. I mean, I am such a foodie. I love my food and the food here is just next level. I'm I'm not a vegan, I I eat everything in in moderation, but I do love vegetables and the the vegetarian and vegan food here is just so tasty. Me and producer Juliet went out for dinner last night and we had like two plates of sushi, some nazi goreng, which is like fried rice with egg and, and chicken. We actually pulled up on the scooters after I'd done a recording. I said to Jules, I said, Jules, I think you've, I think you've chosen a really expensive restaurant here. It's like, I think to myself, I'm not sure we should walk in there because I think it's going to be really expensive. It's like um, made out of bamboo and wood and it just looked amazing. It had like this really fancy bar at the front and then, and then we walked through the back. The waiters were like accompanying us to our table like, hello, missus, hello, hello. Walk through the back and there's this amazing view. Well, it would be amazing um, if we went there for sunset, but even at nighttime, it was amazing. Like the stars, it was so clear. And the people here are just so nice. I can't even get over it. Everyone's just pretty chilled. All the locals, like, you know how usually places that become quite touristy, they get a bit funny with, with tourists, the locals do. They don't seem to have done that here. They seem to be really, really nice to to the tourists here still. There is definitely some sort of barley magic. And, and me and producer Juliet were laughing yesterday. We were like, <laughs> how are we going to leave here? Like, how are we actually going to leave here? It's just so nice and everyone is so friendly. And um, also, I think Juliet, producer <laughs> Juliet, is actually probably going to marry the Breathwork guy because he's um, a little bit dashing, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that one's going to work out, but um, buy your hats, guys. So today we're going to be talking about life coaching. George Cooper is actually a self actualization specialist, so I'm hoping that he'll be able to do some coaching with me and see see what comes up. I spoke with Angelica Alana before we flew out here to find out more about what life coaching actually is and what I should expect from it. Angelica is a life coach turned spiritual teacher and she helps women to transform their lives with visualization, yoga, meditation, spiritual tune-ups, and personal development. She's traveled all over the world studying different healing modalities and has dedicated her life to sharing them. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So I guess I just wanted to say before going into it, my preconceptions of what life coaching is or teaching And correct me if I'm wrong. No, there's no wrong. It's your associations. You're welcome to them. (laughs) Oh, okay, okay. (laughs) I'm already being coached. So I would say, I presume, say if we were to go on a journey together of coaching, you would help me establish what my goals are, why I want to do them, and 
sort of tackle the stages of that. Would that be correct? Yeah, that's like one languaging. I think the languaging that I would use, although it's definitely along that track, is getting to your true desires. I work specifically with women and gender non-conforming people. And so the level of programming that we have around owning what we want is thick and heavy. Like getting out under the legacy of patriarchy is no joke. That's not to say that men aren't brilliant, beautiful creatures. I'm in a long-term partnership with one and I have brothers and a father whom I love dearly, all that jazz. And we've been living in a world that's only just waking up out of thousands of years of suppressing women and gender non-conforming people. So what does that mean? It means that for us to own what we want is not so simple. And so usually when I ask women, what do you really, really want? That's an important question. It can be really hard to answer. So then we start with what in your life is apparent that you say you don't want. Then we start there. So what are the problems or the challenges, the things in your life that are happening that you don't want? And so what we get to do is dive into a few things. One is the desires. One is the unacknowledged desires. That's that shadow work. There's parts of us that say we don't want to drink, but really do we want to acknowledge like, what are we getting from that? That's the shadow work aspect of getting real with ourselves. So yes, it would be initially acknowledging desires, if you know what they are, some people are really clear, unacknowledged desires, shadow work, and then soul level desires. So that's going actually what's underneath that. So we might say, people may have never thought about this, which is so beautiful to say, you know, I really want, I want to find love. That's a big one. Or I want to make money. That could be another one. But what does that really mean? We think we want to make a million dollars and I'm sure probably everyone listening does, right? (laughs) Maybe not, but maybe like, yeah, that'd be great. I want that. Some people really want it. But what's underneath that, what you'll usually find is for me when it comes to money and as I'm expanding my earning capacity and continue to, as soon as I became aware that it wasn't money that I really wanted, it's freedom. That's one of my top values. That's what always comes up. Definitely. (laughs) Yeah. I want to be free to choose any choice in the game. For some people, it's safety. That's also important, right? You have to have a certain level of inner safety. And I'm a white woman who grew up in Australia. So that's a level of privilege, which means my nervous system has been wired. Not completely. I've definitely had to do a lot of work around safety still, but there was a base level of safety in my system, which meant that the next thing I was reaching for was freedom. That would yet be the beginning for sure. That's like session one. And as you can imagine, that unravels a whole bunch of stuff. Did you have a coach? before going into coaching? I've actually never had a coach and that's not something. No, (laughs) I'm really surprised. Yeah. It's not something I'm proud of. I would love to have a coach and a mentor. I just haven't found them yet. And I'm definitely open to it. This year I've met mentors and teachers for the first time, which is really, really exciting for me. And I've been calling that in for a long time. I've had guides in the unseen and the seen. I'm very blessed. Most of my friends are in this field. And of course, my greatest teachers were books. I'm a voracious reader since I was a kid. So I have to say, whenever you speak, you always seem to back it up with quite a lot of science, which I think works really well. A lot of people who sometimes get the ick. Mm. There's still definitely a part of me that I love all this area of like life coaching, of alternative therapies. You know, I've had my own experiences of I can't even put a name to it, yeah. energy or yeah. whatever it is. It's ineffable. Yeah. But there is still a part of me that feels a bit embarrassed to talk like this. So I think, you know, having life coaches talk about these things and yourself put some science behind it will really, really help people. Yeah. I think one of the biggest issues of the industry is that actually it's a great gift and it's also a weapon. And I always say to clients, all of our greatest gifts when we're unconscious become our greatest weapons, right? Like for myself, I would say communication is one of my gifts. Mm. If I'm unconscious, woo, honey, like that (laughs) becomes a big old weapon. I get to watch that and work with that, right? I would say I've been in the healing and transformation space. I don't call myself a life coach. I know that for those who are not in this industry, they would say, okay, that might be the entry point. I've actually gauged from clients, what am I? What would you say? They would say, you're a spiritual teacher, you're a spiritual guide, you're a spiritual mentor. It's usually around spirituality because that's my portal, you know. Although I love science and I love the intersection between, you know, neuroscience or neurobiology and, and spirituality, it's really important to me to be grounded. Again, that's a lesson from my youth being in these mental health facilities. A lot of the people in those facilities are gifted a spiritually gifted. I had some of the most deep, profound, like I, my hair's stand on end still today with these people in these beautiful beings who were not grounded 
and, you know, would turn to substance either to switch off their spiritual capacity or to deepen it, but without, you know, all sorts of things. And so the gift in that pain for me, the line from karma to dharma, as you would say, from pain to purpose, was to really understand on a visceral level how important it is to be grounded. So the more I expand my spiritual gifts, the more I expand my capacity to support people in healing and transformation, the deeper I must go into the earth and the ground and being really grounded. So all of that roundabout way to say that the life coaching industry is not regulated. So what that means is that, and I've written about this a lot, there's a lot of charlatans And so I constantly ask myself that question, which I think a lot of people don't. Again, that's the unacknowledged. When we don't acknowledge our own shadow, that's the people you really need to watch. If they're never asking themselves, is this integrity? Is this true? And that's why it's also important for me when things come through my channel, I look, I research, is there science that backs this up? Is there not? Sometimes there isn't. And that's okay too. Sometimes science takes a while to catch up to spirituality. We're seeing that a lot now, but that could be the issue. So for anyone listening, it's like, you need to be in your discernment. But then the issue is when people are in pain or desperation, you know, I mean, the analogy I think of is like, I've been in desperation with my business sometimes to hire people because I need help and I don't do the proper background previously. I have now, I have a great assistant, thank God, but I was desperate. So I was just like, oh my God, here's this person. They seem great. Please help me. And (laughs) they're not the right fit and it makes it worse. And so I think because it's not therapy, it is not regulated. The gift in that is that people can go way deeper if they're skilled and talented and experienced and grounded and in integrity beyond, far beyond the scope of what traditional work can do. And then the challenge is that it's not regulated. So people dive in before they're ready. They're not experienced. They're not truly open yet. They're not there yet. And you know, they're not being real with themselves and their intentions are pure. Before I'd met anyone in this sort of space, I think if someone had used the term life coach, I probably would have been more open to it than spiritual teacher when I wasn't in that space. Whereas now I'm a bit more okay with it. I would be okay with it. But it is very weird. It shows that the right teacher will sort of show up for you at the right time. Absolutely. And I think I find like the women whom, on the gender non-conforming people whom I work with are deeply spiritual and grounded. They want the science as well and they want the application. They don't just want pretty words and ideology. They want methodology, which is a real backbone of what I do. I've never really had anyone show up at my door. And even when I did my yoga, which is how I started out, I built a one-to-one client base very quickly of yoga clients. I was doing energy work and healing on them and they were fully open. And, and so that I think also is a you know, and this is usually powerful CEOs, men who are not necessarily, wouldn't maybe be outwardly facing spiritual or getting energy work. And yet I think there's two things to that. One, I built a container of trust and safety with them. And so then they wanted to go further and deeper. They had a desire and an an inquiry. So I think that's twofold. It's like the universe delivers you the people who are matched to your frequency. I believe that. Everyone listening has to choose what they believe. I've validated that through my personal experience. That's what I've experienced. Two, once those people show up on your doorstep, it's our job as the people who are teachers, facilitators, or coaches, therapists, whatever, in this healing and transformation space to set up a container of safety and trust. We have to earn that. That takes time. And if so, then people will really surprise you, like how deep they'll want to go. Yeah. What do you think, if you were to reflect, what do you think it is about coaching that helps people make those changes? I think, again, because it's such a vast, unregulated thing, it's completely different. So I can only really speak from the work that I do. And I guess I can kind of touch on other work. So This is an outdated, slightly outdated. It's not that it's outdated, but the trying brain method I'm going to touch on, stick with me. It's very basic. I think it's important for all of us to know. (laughs) It's not going to be too complex. And some of you listening may already be neurobiologists or neuroscientists. And if you are and you're interested in spirituality, please look me up. We need to be friends. But if you're not and you want to learn a little bit, then the trying brain system essentially breaks our brain into three main parts, which is the thinking, logical, rational brain, which is our neocortex. Then you've got the emotional brain, which is our limbic system. And then you've got the unconscious mind, which is also where a lot of deep trauma and stuff can be stored, which is our reptilian or one of my teachers likes to say the primal brain. And the reason I bring that up is because most talk therapy or most coaches, like if you've gone to some coaching institute, 
again, I, I didn't do any formal study. And I'm not ashamed of that because if you look at someone like Paul Stamets, for example, he's the leading expert on mushrooms. He's contributed to the field of health, mushrooms, psychedelics. He's freaking using mushrooms to create termite-free homes and for heal, like just wild stuff, never formally educated. So some of the most incredible inventions and stuff we have are from people who are self-educated because they're curious. But I think a lot of people, if their intentions aren't necessarily pure or they're feeling a bit lost or there are some amazing courses and teachers, but I think some people do the courses to feel credible to then do the work rather than actually doing the deep work to feel in integrity to do the work. So side caveat, and a lot of those courses will teach you just neocortex stuff. So mindset, limiting beliefs, how to ask good questions, all really important stuff, sense-making really important, right? We need that. That's a fundamental part of our healing, but it only goes so far. And so if anyone listening has ever done traditional talk therapy or worked with a coach who's just mindset, very cortical thinking, what you'll find is you'll probably find some healing and some deep healing maybe even, but you also might find there's a lot more. There's a lot more to go, but you don't know how to touch it. Some of that work will even get into the emotional and the limbic system, but very little of that work will actually get deep enough into trauma. So that's like your reptilian primal brain, your unconscious mind. So things like breath work and certain tantric practices, all of which are a part of the methodology that I do, somatic work, will get deep into the primal system. So I don't just work with talk therapy or like talk coaching. I specifically use ritual and direct experience. Like you said earlier, you're like, I've had some experiences. I can't even put them into words. That's important because it's not my ideology that matters when you go out into the world. None of that doesn't matter. What does that mean? You need a methodology so that you can have a direct experience of yourself, your deeper self, and maybe even spirit or divine, whatever you call that, no one can take that from you and no one can give it to you. All I can do is guide you through a methodology. So that's that deep sort of somatic level. Although on the flip side, you have people going away, let's say you travel to Peru and you do ayahuasca or something, because psychedelics are also another really powerful way, if used in a right healthy context, to access that reptilian brain, the unconscious stored trauma you can get deep access to that. But what do you need when you have deep access to that? You need integration. You need to go back to the top level, the neocortex and sense make, right? So the issue is some people might go to an ayahuasca retreat off in Peru that maybe isn't ethically organized with integrity. Some of them are freaking amazing. Some are not. And it can actually do more harm than good because you unearth all of this trauma. You do all of this deep work. You see all of these things. How do you make sense of it? That's that word you hear integrate. And people say, what does that actually mean? You know, one of those words that everyone uses that happens a lot in this industry. <laughs> what does that actually mean when you say integrate? <laughs> yeah, what does it mean? Yeah. Let's get into cortical thinking. Let's make sense. We are the meaning making animals. One of the greatest ways we can do that is through narrative and story. So stories and the story of self is really important. And that's that top level. That's important. That's that cortical thinking. Like for example, if someone's depressed, usually they've lost the ability. There's a whole lot of biochemical stuff going on, but from a narrative perspective, they've lost the ability to enlist themselves as the hero in their own story because they're outside of their window of tolerance for whatever's happening to them within them or around them. And so what therapists or good coaches will usually do is try to help them re-enlist themselves as the hero in their story by helping them to make sense of all the data points and give them tools to get back inside their window of tolerance, right? That's hugely important, but it won't touch on the trauma and it won't go deep enough to access some of the stuff that's unconscious that we don't even know, that we're not even consciously aware of that's affecting our daily reactions and responses and who we are. That's that under the ocean iceberg. But then on the flip side, the issue is if you go and access that by doing some psychedelic work that's not in integrity and doesn't have someone to support you in integrating, integrating means taking that stuff that we experienced and making sense of it with someone who's trained to support you in doing that, or maybe even just a friend. Sometimes we integrate with a friend just by talking about it. If you're an external processor, that's like myself, someone who <laughs> you can't notice, could talk <laughs> underwater, um, I process out loud. That's why mirror work's good for me, talking out loud, journaling. If you're an internal processor, again, journaling, thinking, reflecting, that's integrating, bringing things up into the cortical mind where you could make sense of it. So for me, my work I choose to hit on all those three points. Those are important for me, the deep somatic healing, the, unco- the stuff that's ineffable, energetic, spiritual work, emotional work, limbic system, memory, tribe, community support, that kind of stuff. And then the top level, which is that cortical thinking, sense-making. Most coaches or therapists that you go and see, I won't talk about therapists, different industry, but it's also true for that. Most coaches that you'll see will only do cortical thinking. They'll only sort of do that top level stuff. Really important. Absolutely wonderful. For me, not enough. 
Yeah. So what we need to get that deep access is safety. And that's usually step one for me with clients is how do we create safety within ourselves? Because especially as women and gender non-conforming people, we've been given so much programming around our bodies. We've been taught essentially to internalize a no, a no to who we are, a no to our ideas, a no to our bodies. And that creates a sense of not feeling safe, not feeling safe in your own body, mind and being. That doesn't give you deep access right, to what is in that unconscious area that's stored. So in order to get in there, have the deep access to do the healing and transformation, step one is always safety. So a big question that you guys, anyone listening, can take away today to sort of just scratch the surface on that is when do I feel unsafe when I'm actually safe? Or when do I feel disproportionately unsafe when I'm actually relatively safe. And that will start to show you some of those ski slopes, some of those neural networks, some of those associations that could be linked to trauma. But how do I start to restore safety in those moments? That's some of the biggest work we can do as humans, but specifically, again, women and gender non-conforming people. And so the question for me is, can I wake as many people up as possible to consciously engaging with their growth process so that they don't have to learn through pain and suffering, which is karma? They don't have to be forced to move by squeezing from the universe, by pain. Can they wake up and listen to their body signals, listen to their heart, listen to their intuition, take all the data that's coming in around them all the time and start to listen. And it's not about always being blissed out, blah, blah, blah. Unless you're enlightened, I'm definitely not. And that's not the path I'm here to walk. I have a relationship. I desire to have children one day. I run a business and therefore I'm not going to be a monk on a mountaintop abstaining from life and and transcending life. My dharma is to be amidst the mud and to dance, to make love and life out of it, right? So then my intention for people is not to get to the end of a coaching journey or a container, which is what I would call it, a transformational container or healing journey. At the end of that journey, it's not to that they're going to be a perfect person, but instead that they're fully equipped that when they get bumped off, because they will, they know more about who they are and how to get back to center and what even is center. Some people have never tasted what their center even feels like. That's important, right? It was so great to meet Angelica. She's a little bit of a guru in this space. So now I'm off to meet George Cooper to experience it for myself. Hi. Hi. How are you? Mwah. I'm here with George Cooper. He's a specialist in self-actualization. He guides people navigating major challenges and helps people to explore and unleash untapped potential. He's got an incredible story of building a hugely successful startup until a health crisis made him rethink his path. So what is self-actualization and what is your journey? How did you get to this point? Well, self-actualization is it's the actualization of our innate potential. So it's not just learning a skill like we do or learning from books like we do in school, it's it's really tapping into our innate potential. Like we all have unique gifts to share with the world. And often we only get to these gifts when we step out of the, the conventional road and then doing the things that, that we're told to do, which we often get to uh, through certain challenges in our lives because they they show where, we, where we've been living out of alignment. And yeah, I can say that I've been privilege to experience both ends of the spectrum in life. As you said in the introduction from building a usually successful startup company to playing top sports when I was younger, living in incredible places around the world, Amsterdam, London, Barcelona, South Africa, but I also uh, dealt with um, yeah some, some challenging times, the crossover of my best friend Dennis, extreme failure, the separation from my stepson, which was, which was a devastating experience. And eventually a breakdown of my of my health due to uh, due to blood poisoning, which forced me to step down as the CEO of my company. And for me, that was the moment I was in the hospital. I was in quarantine for for three weeks, and that was the moment where I started to question everything. Because before that happened, I was a successful startup entrepreneur, and I thought mm. I knew it all. I was reading self help books since I was fourteen years old. I know all the answers. I have a startup company. Everyone likes me. And there I was in the hospital, completely broken down. And I didn't, I didn't know anything at all. That was the realization. And that was so beautiful because it got me curious again. And that opened up my world. And it, it basically left me with the question is one of the questions from Dr. Gabor Mate is like, if you're not the person who you've taken yourself to be. Mm. So who am I if I'm not the extreme entrepreneur? Who am I if I'm not that kind, generous and flexible person in mm. a relationship. 
yeah, and that led me uh, on the path of self-actualization in the beginning. Yeah, I just wanted to understand how it was possible that I crashed myself into the hospital because obviously I had a blood poisoning, but I knew it was not something like externally. I knew I manifested this disease. My body created this disease to give me permission to stop what I was doing wow. because my life was so destructive. I can totally relate to what you're saying, like trying to get to that high point and then crashing, I guess, because of it and actually realizing this perception that you've built of yourself is not yeah, sort of thing. So do you mind me asking, what was the startup and how did you actually get blood poisoning? I've not, I've not even heard of anyone ever getting that before. The startup company was a, um, a loyalty platform for small and medium-sized retailers. Mm. So think of like Starbucks, for example, they have their own mobile app with mobile payments, loyalty, rating feedback, whatsoever in it. Obviously, there are a lot of other that don't have the resources to create an app themselves. And we created this universal platform for them to, to use it. And I don't regret it at all because it, it has been a beautiful experience. Learned a lot from it. Yeah, how did I get a blood poisoning? I still don't know. Oh, really? I was, um, I was in Barcelona celebrating my birthday and we were going out to a nice restaurant and we were sitting there and I had my first glass of wine, so it couldn't be the alcohol. And I started to see like black dots and I couldn't notice anymore where the sounds and voices were coming from. I was very like disorganized. And to the point that I said to one of my friends, I, I, I need to go home. I, I need to lay down. He noticed as well by looking at me that something was wrong. And after half an hour at home, he came home too and he checked in and like I started already like shaking. And he asked me like, hey, do you think you can make it home? So we got on the first plane and on the plane I already like I faded out. And from there we landed the plane on the landing strip. I went in the ambulance. And from there on they've, they've started treating me with heavy antibiotics and it became like a horrible intense journey in the hospital and I never found the bacteria because of the, uh, the heavy antibiotics. But for me, it was not a question, where is it coming from? Was it from being here in the tropics that summer or was it because of my destructive lifestyle? And for me, it was super obvious is that I had been neglecting my needs and my values, literally burning myself out for the sake of success of the company, mm. whilst also dealing with the grief from losing my best friend and the separation of my stepson. Like there were so many things going on and I was just suppressing my emotions and suppressing my needs. So I think it was my body's way of saying no. Yeah, stop. Yeah. Sounds like a horrible time to go through. Why do you think you were pushing yourself that much in the first place? Because, you know, you hear this story so many times of people becoming really successful CEOs and burning out, you know, not even having to get to the point of being a CEO now. I think you can be in a lower level position and still burn out. I know I've certainly been there myself. What do you think it is that was making you just go and go and go? Well, obviously that became my question. Like that was my journey to uncover and eventually unlearn the beliefs and behaviors that were causing this. It became a journey of trauma recovery, both physically, mentally, emotionally, on all levels. First of all, I had to heal my body, which took months, but I also wanted to understand, hey, what was the underlying root cause of this? Mm. Why did I push myself so hard? So I went from researching shock trauma to researching developmental trauma. What happened in my childhood that created these beliefs to push myself so hard? I probably came into this world with an innate drive just to explore and grow. That's just in me. If you ask my parents, they say like, you, you were able to walk before anyone could walk. And I definitely see that. But on the other hand, I, I struggled in school. Like if in, if in elementary school, I got kicked out and I already had to move to another school, make new friends. So mm. something happened there and I don't really know what it was. I didn't have trouble learning. I had trouble like connecting with teachers and stuff, which yeah. was affecting my learning. Then I had to go to, to high school, but my teacher in elementary school thought that I wasn't smart enough to go to a normal school. And I, re I still remember that conversation. And, and that was really tough because it, it showed me for the second time that I was different or that, that yeah. I wasn't good enough which really left a mark on me. And at the same time, I was really, really good at playing hockey. And through that, I learned that, hey, if I'm the best, people like me. So the coach likes me, people like me, girls like me. Um, so that became my coping mechanism. Like every time I moved from one hockey club to another hockey club, because I went higher up, um, I learned, hey, if I'm the best here, I'm liked, I'm accepted, I'm respected, I'm admired. Uh, I can give myself permission to be the one who I want to be. I started applying that pattern to every everything, yeah. every single situation in my life, which obviously became very destructive. So if you then ask the question, hey, why did you push yourself so hard? Underneath there's just this, it's 
a lack of self-worth. There's a, actually a lyric in a Kanye West song that I always think of. The people highest up got the lowest self-esteem. There you go. Yeah. And I always think it is so true. But you've turned this into an amazingly positive experience and you obviously help other people now who are going through similar things, I presume, or challenges within their life. And how do you think what you do can help people feel good? Help them feel good. Well, initially, I wouldn't say necessarily makes them feel good at the beginning because it's it's really, it's, it's hard work. And mm. um, a lot of people are indeed looking for the feel good solution, the, 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 quick, the quick results. And I often explain is that the people that come to me, it's the last 2% of, of the personal development spectrum that they're in. So the first 98% is going to listen, listen to a podcast and there's nothing wrong with it mm-hmm. because that's the, the start of the journey where we, where we become curious. Hey, there might be another way. I want to be inspired, but we're not ready to make the change yet because it's far too comfortable yet to just remain the same. And that's the same. Then we go after listening to podcasts, we might join a group workshop or an online course and whatsoever. And eventually you come to the point where you really want to make that change. And those are the people that come to me. What I do with them is, is that we really embrace the major challenge in their lives or the major opportunity, um, but it's often a challenge or a conflict, to rethink and unlearn the beliefs that are separating them from becoming who they have the potential to be. Because obviously it's still a challenge because they're holding themselves back there. Because it's something is not aligning with who they are. It is interesting that you say that. It does feel like, so obviously we've been sorting out all the episodes for the for this podcast and it's kind of all naturally fallen in, in an order that seems to be working in that way. So obviously we did the women's circle initially, mm. which was really great for like opening up and sort of acknowledging what some of my triggers were. Then the other day I tried breath work with Edward Dangerfield, I know you're good friends with him. Mm-hmm. That uncovered stuff that I'd like, even deeper, it felt like that I ha- wasn't aware. It, it wasn't in the forefront of my mind. I presume it's in my subconscious. And then now with you, it feels like it's that kick, that like, oh. Yeah, it's a kick and it's, it, why? let's call it a kick of awareness. So uh, coming back, how does it make people feel good? It makes people feel more empowered. With a lot of psychology, it's focused on discovering why you are the way you are. And it doesn't really matter why. It is important that we understand a bit of your past. But what's far more important that we understand what adaptive survival strategy, what behaviors have you developed in response to an environment of failure in your past? Mm. Because as as soon as we know that, we can see, hey, it doesn't really make sense anymore to hold on to that survival pattern, such as overachieving, such as perfectionism. And then we can start letting go of it. And that empowers people to like something that was a challenge or a conflict is to just move away from it. Not because they're changing something externally. It's because they're growing their capacity to deal with it. I do think sometimes that is the the weird thing within like therapy or a lot of these things that we do. A lot of it is revisiting past trauma. And sometimes I wonder how helpful it is just revisiting the past trauma. Like you then need to have the tools, which hopefully you'll give me, to, you know, actually move away from that and realize what those past traumas have actually done to you rather than, you know, like poking the wound over and over again. Yeah, well, my personal opinion on this and and, and especially like also the latest developments in psychology, it, it's moving away from from the why, from the story mm-hmm. And from all the events, even like the, the greatest leader, Dr. Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk and stuff, they all say like, it doesn't really matter what happened in their sessions. They don't, they don't want to understand everything. It's far more important that we understand what it did to you mm. on the emotional level and what, yeah, what protective and adaptive behaviors you have developed in order to cope with that. So that we can start unlearning those, those patterns. Would you say you're quite interested in like the scientific side of it all? Yeah, combining it both. Like I'm like I'm definitely rooted in science because to to understand like human nature in general, like it's important that that we that we look into science, but at the same time, it's also through my own lived experiences and it's also through just innate intelligence of the bo- of the body. I don't I don't believe that we that we know everything about the body. That would be that we blunt arrogance. Like you did breath work, for example. Yeah. You can't explain what happens there. That's really no. it's really hard, but it's so hard. And the same goes for like I've I sat in in dozens of plant medicine ceremonies with ayahuasca. Yeah, there's not much science around that. But you feel something and you felt something when you've done that then. Yeah, and, and it sounds very woo-woo, but I feel that the plant is inside of me. As soon as I'm doing my work, I'm I'm tapping into that knowledge. Mm. 
and because it's probably because ayahuasca has taken me to places. So for people listening who don't know what ayahuasca is, it's uh, I know a little bit about it because I am quite intrigued about it. It's in like Peru and places like that. Am I correct? Well, it's, it's a, a, ayahuasca is, is a plant from the Amazon and it's a, song, it's a psychedelic and it has been used for, for years and years and years and years by, by tribes to, to heal the tribes. And yeah, if you ask me, it is the medicine moving forward because it just wow. allows people to, to expand their, their consciousness and their human consciousness, which I think is, is necessary for our world. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so nervous. I think I'm scared what you're like going to unearth. Just for your own sense of safety, know that I won't go anywhere that you don't want to go. Okay. You. So you're fully in control. And whenever you feel like, oh, this might be a little bit too, comes too close, just say it. Okay. Good? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, amazing. Before we kick off, actually, like, what, what makes you nervous? Well, the word that comes up is exposed, being exposed. But it's weird because I think I am quite an open book and I, you know, have shared quite a lot already up to this point. So I don't really know what I'm a bit nervous about because I don't feel like there's much that's off limits that I'm okay with sharing. I feel like I'm okay with sharing quite a lot, but mm. for some reason the word exposed keeps coming up. So maybe there is something that yeah, yeah. I'm not as comfortable sharing as I thought I would be. Yeah, and there's this thing like we're we're all super biased, and and it's funny when we get on this self improvement journey of personal development, whatever we call it, we believe that we we start to know ourselves, <laughs> and um, that is one of the biggest misconceptions on the, on this journey because like still 95 or for some people even more like up to 98 percent of of all their beliefs and behaviors isn't. isn't subconscious so there is a lot to expose um, but we'll take it step by step we're not going to expose <laughs> everything at once so yeah thanks for uh, thanks for coming and showing up it's normal to feel a little bit nervous because what is happening is is that with personal development we basically speed up the process of change and with change we go through four stages and the first one is denial and in the denial stage is we kind of feel that something is off, but we're still projecting it on, 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 on the external world. So it is our manager, it's our job, it's due to COVID, it's whatever. And we're very rooted in our past beliefs and we're in our current beliefs. And then, yeah, but then when you start working with a coach, it becomes a little bit scary because this coach is going to take you to the next stage, which is the resistance stage. And the resistance stage is like, okay, hey, we're going to move from the denial, from the unconscious incompetence towards the conscious incompetence. In other words, we're going to look more within. Hey, what is it within you? Which, what are the weaknesses? What are the fears? What are the insecurities that are holding you back from moving forward? So it's it's normal. Okay. But well, we're going to do it one step at a time. Okay, thank you. Good? Yeah, all good. So what brings you here today? I feel like one of the things I would quite like to talk about is my career. So I feel like I have, so I can come up with a new business idea basically every day. I've started up some businesses and I have freelanced and done, I've like trained as things and stuff, but I, I never seem to be able to get to a point where I'm like, okay, yeah, this is what I want to do, or this is what I feel comfortable with. I've got a personal trainer qualification. And I set up a internal communications podcast company that helps people connect in large businesses. And I also have, like, I have a plot of land in Anglesey by the sea. I'd quite like to turn that into something to do with wellness things. Like, I just never really seem to be able to get past that point where I'm like, I don't know, really give a shit about it. And like, I love... Uh, I do a lot of stuff with the radio. So um, I'm on BBC Radio quite a bit and obviously this podcast and I absolutely love that. So I feel like there's something there that I could make it into like a 
you know, a thing. I've done so much work for the BBC now. I just really want that to get to the next level. And because at the moment I'm sort of doing freelance writing and, and PR and communications and stuff, but I hate sitting in front of a computer all day. It drives me insane. I've got too much energy. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing. So if we d- dive into a little bit deeper there, like there's a desire to do more. Yeah. And you come up with all these ideas and you have a plot of land that you can do something with and there's this and there's that and maybe a few other ideas come up over the next few weeks here in Bali. <laughs> but yeah, w- what is the real pain point there? I find it quite difficult not having a steady income, so like a monthly income because it that makes me feel more secure. But when I'm in a monthly income sort of situation... I hate it. I can't stand, you know, the monotony of a nine to five, Monday to Friday, get up, go into the office, sit in front of a desk. I can't stand that sort of thing. Mm. So, and I feel like I've got lots of talents, but I almost feel like I just can't harness them. Mm, thank you. How does that feel like when you, like, obviously when you're in that, that let's say that good enough pattern. So you're doing all these things that are en- enjoyable, provide you with an income, some sense of security. You have these ideas, you kind of know, deep down, you know you can execute these ideas. I just always feel like I'm not living up to my full potential. Thinking of back what you were saying about at school, I struggled at school quite a bit as well. All my teachers used to always say, if you just tried a little bit harder, if you just got a bit more organized, then you'd do good. And like, I went to a school that you had to take an exam to get into. So everyone was quite intelligent there. And so I I was in the bottom set for everything. Weirdly at this school, it was actually more uncool to not be clever. But then I found it really difficult because in my exams, I did really, really well. And then in work, I did well. And then when I was on The Apprentice, I did well. So I know that I am intelligent and I know I've got a lot of gifts to sort of like share with the world. But there is this constant like underlying thought, like I'm stupid. I am stupid. I can't get organized. I suppose sometimes I get imposter syndrome still with that where I'm like, oh shit, they're going to find out who I actually am. <laughs> mm-hmm. But let's dive, d- dive a little bit deeper. And like, if you, what would happen if you, if, you, if you don't change? What are the consequences if you just hang around in that good enough pattern? Which there's nothing wrong with that, but like, how would that affect you? I guess I'd probably just feel really disappointed in myself. And also like just the security. I just would like, you know, at the moment I'm doing very well in my contract jobs and stuff like that. But I don't know what my life's going to look like in six months time. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. After this series, it's like, okay, I'm out in the ocean again. And I know a lot of people do that with having their own businesses, including yourself. You know, you don't necessarily know where your next client's coming from, but to me that just feels really scary. But then I know what the alternative is, you know, Mm. get the office job nine to five that makes me depressed. So it's, yeah. So it's either I'll end up in the nine to five office job that I hate feeling depressed every day (laughs) or I do take the risk and go with something like this. What would give you, um, have you ever thought about it? What would give you security? Because obviously like if if you're going to go after your potential, it comes with taking some risk. Mm. That's why more people choose for a nine to five job and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with a nine to yeah. five job. I mean, we don't necessarily have to become depressed either because if that job aligns with our values and who we are and our skills and stuff, it can still be fun, but it does come with some security and often yeah. we are willing to exchange some of our desires and some of our needs in exchange for that security. Yeah. So if we want to go, if we really want to create a career from what I call a place of authenticity and wholeness, and, and actualize our potential. We have to give up a little bit on that security. To be honest, when you are saying that, I have just realized I have had some jobs nine to five in an office, which I absolutely loved. Like it, I was brainstorming, very creative, you know, doing stuff. And I was, I did actually love it. So maybe you're right, maybe it is more, it's not that maybe. I had one really, I had one job that really, affected my self-esteem and stuff and it was in that nine to five setting but no one spoke and it was like a very different to the other one that I'm thinking of now which I actually loved whereas that other one was just a bit toxic. Mm. Thank you so it's also very clear how our past experiences shape our beliefs and our assumptions about in this case for example a nine to five job. So, so what I see with a lot of my clients that 
because they associate a corporate job or a high achieving job with having to sacrifice their needs and their and their values, which is not necessarily true. They had to do it because they didn't de- develop the capacity to make decisions that were right for them due to the lack of awareness, and due to the lack of autonomy. So it's more important here to look at what is it that you truly desire? Do you desire going off on your own and building your own little empire? Or could you work also in a corporate job and have that freedom and the security? Yeah, I mean, freedom and security are like, to me, really, really important. But somehow in some, like in my brain, they feel quite like they can't exist together, which I know obviously isn't true. But there is obviously a belief within me that thinks security, freedom can't exist together. Dun, dun, dun. Where's that coming from? My mind's gone blank. That never happens. Like genuinely, I'm not just bullshitting you that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Can, can come from any, uh, anywhere, of course. But it's an interesting one because it's, it's very black and white. Mm. So it's either I work for a corporate nine to five and I give up everything that's important to me and I become depressive or I start my own business and it's all going to be brideful. Yeah. Which I know from my own experiences and from working with a lot of mm. entrepreneurs that it's like having your own business is not always as brideful as we think yes. it is. Yes. And I know this as well, to be fair. I think the, that's the thing. I just feel a bit like, I feel like I'm at a fork in the road and I can sort of, go in several different options and I like don't know whether to go left or right. So I just, just stay. Just, just stay here for a little bit and let's explore the ideas, that, the idea that you get most excited about. Okay. What do you think it will give you? Connection with people. Like I love talking to people and finding out all about them. Um, and then I guess just doing something every day that is actually fun and enjoyable. Like this is like, it, I could do this all day, every day. I enjoy it so much. Just talk, like find out your story. And and then I also think a lot of the stuff that I've learned throughout my sort of journey, I'd love to share with the world. But there is part of me that's also a bit like embarrassed about some of this stuff that I've experienced. Personally, what comes alive for me and, and maybe doesn't resonate. So take what works and then yeah, leave, yeah. leave what doesn't. But it, it's truly what I hear is it's just making the most of your individual journey that you are already on. Like it's like that domino effect is already happening, Mm. but there's some resistance still like you're trying to hold back those stones from falling over. Yeah. And let's explore the future a little bit. What would happen if you don't resist anymore and if you just let those stones fall and roll, if you just let the domino effect happen? I do try to do that a lot. And I think over the last few months, because everything's been on hold because of COVID, I've just had to go with it and see how everything goes. And it has felt quite nice. It's just then very occasionally I'm like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Let's explore the future a little bit. Uh, because you just mentioned like the, the past six months has been going very well for you. Let's do it times 10. Then, and let's see where you would stand in a year from now. What would it look like? i would be doing another series of this. <laughs> and I would like to set up some classes and stuff near me I'd like to do like little yurts and stuff on the field and get people to come and experience like sound healing and breath work and and like coaches and stuff like that like when I see you guys over here and doing the line of work that you're doing and stuff and actually making a living out of it I'm like oh fuck that's so cool that would be a really cool area to sort of like actually you know, earn money from, but it's almost as if I've got like my dad's voice in the back of my head, like that's not a real job type thing. And I know that's not true because people are earning money from it and it's stuff I enjoy and it's stuff I genuinely believe in. First, your tone of voice goes up, you start smiling, (laughs) you start speaking about this retreat and the modalities that you wish to offer. And as you do it, your father starts speaking to you, or at least like the internalized Mm. voice that comes up, uh, that it's not a real career. Yeah. Um, We'll dive into that a little, a little, a little <laughs> later, but I, lo- I love the idea of, of creating the retreat and um, especially like the more specific you become of, of the modalities that you wish to offer in the festival, et cetera. So, okay, let's, let's leave that one there. What else is there? You said like you wish to do another. I would love to continue to do this podcast until like the day I die. <laughs> Honestly, like I just, I feel doing this have felt like the most me that I've probably ever felt because I've sort of been able to combine my love of 
radio, podcasts, talking to people, connecting, wellness, informing people. Like it literally is like, and sometimes I have to pinch myself because I'm like, fuck, I'm like living my dream. So then why am I still beating myself up about other shit? That's what really annoys me. Like, I just wish I was a bit nice to myself. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> Should have brought tissues in here, shouldn't I? <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. And um, yeah, really, uh, I, I love how you also honor those feelings. And all I can say about that is like, keep trusting those feelings and keep following them. Um and we're definitely going to explore a little bit more <laughs> about it, like what's stopping you there, because it's very interesting with with exploring this this desired future, basically. That it that sounds quite reasonable to me. Like you say, hey, I have a plot of land. I want to start start doing these retreats and kind of festivals. You are already doing these series, and it's going well for you. So why wouldn't the second part like be possible for you? It's it's all quite quite reasonable. But at the same time, it brings up like all sorts of stories of why you can't have it or why you don't deserve it or why you should be doing something else. We'll, we'll dive into that mm-hmm. in a little bit. Um, if, if you organize those retreats and festivals and you're doing the, the, the second series of, of this podcast, would that feel like complete to you? Would it make you... No. Would it also give you- <laughs> I'd also like a, a regular slot on a radio station. Okay. Just like a, a regular slot. So I'm like, okay, I know this is where I am at this time. That's what I'm doing. Like it's non-negotiable. And it. I think it would make me sort of know that I'm doing the right stuff. That's beautiful. So out of the three points, again, it comes up like on the one hand, the pursuit of like purpose and actualizing your potential through doing new things, new exciting things, hosting the retreats, the festivals, starting the second series of this podcast, like something that's very close to your heart. And as you just said, like that makes me feel alive. That's just my dream. And on the other hand, having a job, having some consistency and some security. Um, Have you ever thought like what security means to you? What do you need to earn every month in in order to have that feeling? I don't have an, an actual number in my mind. I think it's important to start thinking about that Um, because if we don't have it and and maybe we come from a place of lack, from scarcity. Mm -hmm. Uh, What I experience with my clients who sometimes earn six figures a month, that it's still not enough. And sometimes it helps to bring bring it to our conscious awareness what it actually means to have enough. And I, I noticed it with myself. It's like at the beginning of this year, I set a goal for myself, what I want to earn every month. In January, I went over it by 100 something percent. And February again, and March again. Now my goal, even when I reach it, is not enough. I want more. And I need to keep reminding myself that that specific goal, that that amount of money is more than enough for me. Mm. Because otherwise I, I fall back in that old pattern of overachieving and overdoing and setting bigger goals, and which throws me in the end out of alignment. So it's good for yourself to just come up with an amount of money that you need in order to have that security and what does it look like how much money do you need to get into your account every month how much of that money can you earn yourself and maybe how much do you need from somebody else if any so it could also be getting a loan from someone because that sense of safety will change the way you feel if you change the way you feel it probably becomes easier to step forward and actually actualize those other things It was really interesting hearing from Jordan Angelica all about why it can be so important to have a coach and whether that's helping you find out more spiritual teachings or whether that is finding out what you want to do in your career. I can totally understand and appreciate how having an outsider's perspective and some guidance on how to do that would be really, really helpful. I guess over the next few weeks, I'm just really going to be trying to identify what it is I can do to make myself feel more secure and more safe and and hopefully have something at the end of this journey that I can say, actually, yeah, you know what? Once I establish what these, these things are, I'll be able to get to that next step and achieve what I want to. So if you're also looking to make some changes in your life and you feel like you might need a helping hand, maybe looking into a coach or a counsellor or something along those lines is definitely something that's going to be helping you. One of the other really big takeaways that I've got from this episode and and the idea of coaching is that a lot of our actions are not always what they seem. If I want to 
create a certain type of income is that that I actually want to create that income or is it actually that there's something lower like within me that just wants to feel safe and secure so maybe it is one of those things where it will help you and help me definitely help me identify some of my insecurities deep down that are masking themselves as something that I am trying to achieve in adulthood. Thank you so much Angelica Alana and George Cooper for being part of this episode of Finding Feel Good. If you want to find out more about Angelica Alana, please go to Awaken Woman on Insta. And if you want to find out more about George Cooper, please go to georgecooper.com. We'll put those links in the show notes for you too. And thanks to you so much for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and give the podcast a five-star review. It really helps people to find us. And we'll be back next week with even more adventures into finding feel good. I'll be trying out cacao with Lynette Allen in Bali. And I'll also be speaking to Ashley Guthrie about how cacao works and what I should expect. It has some magic ingredients in there. It has theobromine the one that helps you to feel like you're really in the presence of the divine if you allow your mind to stop that chatter. I'm off for dinner with producer Juliet and Edward Dangerfield from episode three and also his son Onyx. I'll see you next time.